I said, whatever you do, don't, don't hire a yes man, someone that's going to tell you, uh, or it won't tell you the truth. Don't do that. Because if you do, I believe you'll be impeached. And someone has got to be the guy that tells you that, uh, you, know, the, the, you know, you either have the authority or you don't, or, you know, Mr. President, you know, don't, don't do it because whatever, you know, but, but don't hire someone that will just, you know, nod and say, you know, that's a great idea, Mr. President, because you will be impeached. Hmm. That was prescient. That was the president's former chief of staff, John Kelly, an uncontrolled President Trump, he predicted, would end up getting impeached. And it's warnings like Kelly's firsthand accounts from deep inside the president's inner circle that may ultimately lead to a tipping point for some Republican senators who, based on new reporting in the Washington Post, are, quote, lost and adrift as the impeachment inquiry enters its second month, navigating the grave threat to President Trump, largely in the dark, frustrated by the absence of a credible case to defend his conduct and anxious about the historic reckoning that likely awaits them. Quote, it feels like a horror movie, said one veteran Republican senator who spoke anonymously to candidly describe the consensus. Trump and his allies have strained to focus the debate on the process, but Republican officials have struggled to answer for the substance of the startling statements made by the growing list of credible witnesses from the national security and diplomatic realms. That struggle is clear. In the 32 days since the whistleblower complaint was released, We've seen zero pushback on the many revelations that have come out so far, including the White House's summary of that July 25th call, the testimonies of career professionals like Fiona Hill and Bill Taylor, and even admissions by Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Um, Bob Costa, this is an incredible piece of reporting, and I wonder if you could take us through um, what you and, and Phil Rucker report, and then and then add this element of the process being turbocharged by Nancy Pelosi today. Working with Phil, we canvassed the Republican Party over the past week. I spent the week up at the Capitol, and Republican senators were not like House Republicans who were storming in the skiff, the impeachment hearing room. Instead, senator after senator would say to me, Costa, I'm sorry, I'm going to be a juror if there's a trial up here, so I don't want to say anything. Then some of them would walk four or five paces ahead, turn around, and say, come here, <laughs> let's talk. But it wouldn't be on the record. Right. You accept that because yeah. of the charged atmosphere, and they want it to be candid. And they would say privately they're unhappy with the White House, they're unhappy with Mick Mulvaney, the acting chief of staff. They feel like they can't even engage on the substance because they don't know what's going to come out next. They said the White House isn't engaging with them. Senators uh, ranging across the conservative and moderate spectrum aren't getting any kind of talking points or even guidance from the White House. But what you really feel is that they know a trial's coming. And they also know that Mitch McConnell, more than President Trump, is their leader. President Trump, they tell me, and Phil, is in control of the party, but McConnell's in control of the Senate. And they feel they have to trust McConnell's guidance. If he feels the Senate majority's on the line, he's going to let them take certain steps whether it's breaking fully with the president, voting against the president, but they're thinking through privately their range of options because they have their own futures and consciences to think about. So I, I probably don't watch Mr. McConnell as closely as you do, but I did notice that when public approval for impeachment and removal passed 50 percent, Mitch McConnell made his first statement about never having a conversation with Donald Trump in which he said there was nothing wrong with his call with Zelensky. How closely is McConnell watching? And, and now that number, according to Quinnipiac, is at 55 percent of the American public, which imperils, I don't know, at least four or five of his. I think you write about um, Colorado seats. The, I mean, who's in trouble and, and who are you watching now? You're watching people who are close to McConnell, like Lamar Alexander, retiring Republican from Tennessee. We're told behind the scenes he's one of the most anxious about President Trump's conduct. Susan Collins, Senator from Maine, Cory Gardner, uh, Senator Tom Tillis of North Carolina, all up in 2020. But we're also watching people like Pat Toomey of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. not part of the 20 cycle, but someone who in gun control and other issues needs to be seen as somewhat center right if he wants to keep winning in Pennsylvania. He's the kind of quiet senator, along with Rob Portman of Ohio, who could be a problem for the White House if they feel like they cannot stick with this president. 
McConnell's interesting. He gave a PowerPoint presentation to his senators. He's taking the process seriously. You talk to House Republicans on the phone, they say this is going to be a sham trial. It's fake news. Then you talk to Senate Republicans, they go, we have to be ready. We have a constitutional duty. We may not like it, but we have to be ready. It's so interesting to me that the, the sort of conventional wisdom, and, and it's always wrong, I don't know why we even report on conventional wisdom, people like me, has been that you'd never get 20. But I, I think what Bob Costa's reporting shows is that it's a dynamic process. You don't know what you don't know because they don't know what they don't know. Yeah, and I can understand why they're very frustrated with the White House because the White House hasn't given them any defense yet. I mean, there are members. But might that be because there isn't? Well, one? No, but no, of course there's not. But the difference between the House and the Senate, I think, is you very well laid out. You know, the House is filled with silly people like Matt Gates and Jim Jordan who will go out <laughs> and say silly things. You know, we'll, we'll t pick up the president's talking points that it was a perfect call, or repeat Mick Mulvaney and say, "Oh, quid pro quos are okay." That's what the, the the administration does all the time. That's a much harder argument for a senator to make. And and the problem that that I think the president ultimately has here. Here. For years, senators have been able to look the other way at some of Trump's misconduct, some of the things he does, because they don't have to vote on it. And eventually, at the end of the day, there's going to be a trial, and all the evidence is going to be laid out, and they're going to have to vote on it, and the public is going to be watching closely. And I think the, the buckets of senators you lay out, you know, there are four senators who are retiring this cycle, who are no longer accountable to Donald Trump. They don't have to worry about being attacked to him. Lamar Alexander's one, Mike Enzi from Wyoming. There are five other Republican senators in very close seats who have seen their approval ratings plummet over the last month and are in, 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 you know, in, in dire straits for their reelection. They have to worry about not looking like they're his toady in this vote. Mm -hmm. And then there, there are other people who just, I think, at some point might be tired of it, so tired of having to defend him all the time that if the public opinion goes south on this, and that's the key thing to watch is the public opinion. Mm -hmm. He could be in real trouble. I thought it's also interesting that where Mick Mulvaney has some pockets of support in the House from his former silly friends, um, <laughs> not so much in the Senate. No, there's a real frustration among Senate Republicans who had a closer relationship with John Kelly, Reince Priebus, a former party chairman. Mick Mulvaney is a man of the House. He comes from the House of Representatives. He's close to people who are in the Freedom Caucus. And if you're Leader McConnell, senators told me they wanted Don McGahn in there bringing nomination after nomination because if you're going to have a transactional relationship with President Trump, it's got to work like a machine. Get all the conservatives into these judicial posts. Don't care about the president's tweets. It's just nomination after nomination, stealthily overhauling the entire federal government. When that process breaks down a bit and Pat Cipollone is not as focused in the eyes of many senators, then you have a gap politically between the Senate and the White House. It's amazing too, Don McGahn, the guy that sort of kept the president just on the other side of the line of obstruct criminal obstruction of justice and the current White House counsel may get him impeached. Yeah, it's, it's exactly right. The strategy may, may very well backfire. And I think the Mulvaney point is right. Our reporting as well points the deep frustration about how he is both inside and outside the White House, how he has sort of steered the ship here during this impeachment inquiry, that they felt like the president has been angry at him from the beginning about he, uh, that he has not been able to sort of navigate some of these rough waters here, that he hasn't been able to change the storyline at all. And some of that frustration may be unfair, but certainly the acting chief of staff didn't do himself or the president any favors with that news conference 10 days or so ago. Uh, the, the John Kelly point of the clip sound that we played in, though, I mean, certainly he had some success keeping the president in line for a few months, some success. And also, by the end of their relationship, the two men weren't speaking. Correct. So there's a little bit like, it's perhaps the former chief of staff is overstating his ability to have kept the president out of this legal hot water, political and legal hot water right now. But certainly there are Republicans all over Washington who are frustrated. There isn't someone in the building who could provide any sort of guardrails for the president as he goes into this battle. House Republicans know Mulvaney, but they don't all like him. In the <laughs> afternoon yes. after his now historic press conference, <laughs> there were members on the Hill sort of chuckling amongst themselves about what they saw as Mulvaney's uh, over-exaggerated view of his own intellect. When it comes to Senate Republicans, one of the biggest problems for Trump is pretty simple, and that is that a lot of the Senate Republicans just don't like him. They think he's crass, they think he's tacky, they think he's boorish, they're tired of being associated with him, and on a gut level, that's an issue for the president. Uh, on top of that, Part of this is the reason that Bolton's testimony or lack thereof is so consequential. The Senate is a pretty small place, couple dozen Republicans. Bolton also has been a Republican leader for decades. He knows a lot of these guys. Yep. If he comes out against the president hard, that'll be meaningful. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.